We are speaking with Tristan Kenderdine. He is an academic and the research director of Future Risk, which provides tailored consulting on political risk and economic geography. Our topic is China's Belt and Road Stratagem in Central Asia. It's good to have you with us, Tristan, and welcome to the Geopolitics and Empire podcast. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. And now as U.S. hegemony declines, China is the country to watch. In fact, some Pentagon planners are even dismissive of a resurgent Russia and emphasize the Chinese threat as the principal contingency to plan for. It's called the New Silk Road, formerly known as the One Belt, One Road, now rebranded as the Belt and Road Initiative, coupled with its seafaring twin, the Maritime Silk Road. You've been living in the reg region for a number of years, perhaps even a decade. Now, could you tell us about the New Silk Road? What are its hopes and Chinese dreams? Uh, what is it on the surface? And are there any strings attached? Sure. Well, I think fundamentally that it's not a principal strategy. It's a peripheral strategy. Um, China's uh, 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 principal rebalancing is as an ocean power. Um, if you've been following the, the policy on China as a maritime power, that's clearly the, the central aim, is especially uh, regarding uh, uh, moving uh, United States hegemony away from, um, from the Western Pacific. So if you place it in context of, of China trying to assert itself as a two-ocean power in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, uh, as well as looking um, uh, at peripherally at the Arctic Ocean, then the Silk Road strategy through Central Asia uh, to Europe and Africa, uh, inputs from Europe and uh, uh, exporting capital to Africa, uh, just gives China enough leverage that it's not dependent on Singapore, it's not dependent on the United States, it's not dependent on any single chokehold or, uh, or political dominance of any maritime uh, thoroughfare. So the primary uh, goal is still going to be maritime, and the, the, the principal uh, means of, uh, of cargo transport is going to remain maritime. But by giving themselves that 5, 10, 20 percent throughput uh, through Central Asia, uh, then they cut out the, the, the political risk associated with the Malacca Strait or with US hegemony in the Pacific or the Indian Oceans. Now, you know, you ask about whether strings are attached. Uh, there's the, most of the investment that we're seeing in Central Asia or the Middle East and Africa uh, it's a little bit too easy to place them in a geopolitical, um, you know, negative light and say that there are uh, uh, world hegemony strings attached to them. I, I certainly wouldn't be selling that line. But the thing to understand about it is that all of this investment occurs uh, behind a closed capital account. So the clever part about this investment from China is it, it is reaching a stage of industrial development where it's offshoring its capital inputs. Um, you know, it's, it's effectively a, a parallel trade and investment regime that it's created, um, but it's done in a currency that's not convertible. So all the investment that's going into Central Asia, Middle East, Africa, uh, it's RMB denominated. And it can't be anything but RMB denominated. That's the trick about it, that we're moving essentially factories and uh, uh, other Chinese uh, imports into the industrial economy offshore to an external geography, but that external geography effectively operates within China's closed capital model. So um, that's that's the, the, the macro that I've been uh, selling for the past uh, few years. And since you mentioned the Yuan, could you briefly talk about the how China has recently opened these gold exchanges and countries are now, I think Venezuela recently mentioned that they will sell their oil for yuan and then later they'll be, uh, other countries will be able to exchange the yuan for gold. Do you have any comment on, on that? Yeah, I mean, two, two or three main directions there. Firstly, China feels excluded from the Global Power Club. Uh, so uh, at a superficial level, um, you know, it's, it's been out of the Washington consensus. It wants to be in the IMF. It got in the SDR last year, the year before, sorry. Um, so part of it is wanting to be in system and making rules and, and being part of the international uh, institutional club that sets uh, global rules. The other part of it is what I just described, that trying to move through a middle income trap in an industrial economy the size of China's uh, without opening the capital account and maintaining um, reasonably strong command economy uh, institutions, 
uh, means that you, you you're kind of forced into doing these uh, uh, barter arrangements where you're swapping oil or, or other resources um, for for R and B. So I don't think it's a it's a clear strategy um, that China wanted to pursue. I think they're kind of hedged into this, um, but I do expect to see more of it in uh, particularly in Central Africa. And uh, some have questioned China's ability to deliver, citing the stereotype that often products made in China are cheap but poorly constructed. How much of the Belt and Road is, is hype and how much do you think is the real deal and their ability to, to deliver on their promises? Yeah, that's a really good question because, again, there's a two-pronged answer to that. One, on the China side, uh, standards and quality is is really important to the Chinese government right now. Uh, they're, they're sick of, of, of made in China. They're sick of, uh, of low quality goods. And part of their legitimacy is being able to deliver economic goods to the population. So there's very much been a trend the last two, three years uh, to make sure that China's rise up the global value chain goes hand in hand with Chinese consumers being able to consume better quality products. So part of this, of course, part of this putting the capital outside China is uh, to bring in goods, is to bring in better quality goods for the Chinese uh, 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 consumer. So in that sense, China's very much committed to, uh, you know, raising uh, the, the, the quality of the goods that are being manufactured with Chinese capital and the quality of goods that the Chinese consumer uh, uh, is receiving. The question really for a lot of Belt and Road economies is that is China's investment uh, simply offshoring uh, old industrial capacity? So China has too much capacity in, uh, in cement, glass, aluminium, paper, all the big uh, heavy industries. Um, and so the, the, the real uh, trade uh, negotiation um, with these countries and China will be, are they getting the, the, the middle uh, value-added uh, manufacturing uh, factories? Are they getting high technology transfers? And you see in all of these uh, uh, joint statements or um, between Central Asian countries and, and China, I was looking at Uzbekistan's one the other day, is to make sure that they get some technology transfer uh, and that the, the Chinese investment is going towards science and technology development. Now, China is sympathetic to this uh, because it's been playing the game as a receiver for the last 30 years. Uh, so on one hand, it, 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 it's in the control seat now and it knows that it's taking its capital out um, to other economies uh, and that it's in control of uh, technology transfer. Um, but on the other hand, I'm sure they'll be uh, reasonably sympathetic and it plays into the, uh, you know, global... Uh, narrative uh, to be seen as a, a win-win economy and south-south uh, uh, cooperation, that they're going in and they're funding projects and they're transferring technology that the World Bank has failed to do and the Asian Development Bank has failed to do. So, yeah, I, I'm a little bit sceptical still. I think that there's a lot of low-end uh, industrial factories that are going to be transferred, um, but the, the macro narrative, what China needs to be able to sell um, to the world to make uh, to you know to to give them a clear uh, bargaining chip with the with the European Union and the United States is to be able to say that they're they're delivering development uh, and they're, they're they're delivering development in places that uh, the United States and the European Union had failed to do in Central Asia, Middle East, and Africa. And speaking of the EU, you recently you've been writing a lot about this really good. Uh, articles, and you recently wrote a piece um, of how the Belt and Road has focused much on the Northern Rail through Central Asia and, and Russia, as well as the seaports in the Mediterranean and, and in the Indian Ocean. You recently wrote about the Caspian Sea being one of the best bets for the Belt and Road, which would connect China to the EU through a primarily maritime route. This, as you mentioned, this seemed to be a win-win for all the countries involved because countries like Georgia might lessen their uh, dependence uh, on Russian uh, economy. Other countries like Azerbaijan could diversify their economy. Um, could you talk about uh, your theory that this would be one of the best uh, routes? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is one of the things we've been really excited about at Futurist for the past uh, nine months now, 
is that there's so much written about the Belt and Road and so much of it is written from outside perspectives um, and oftentimes just people looking at a map, putting some pins in and saying what they think would happen. Uh, we picked up from uh, National Development Reform Commission in China the Belt and Road Rail Transit Plan uh, nine months ago and nobody else is referencing this, nobody else is, uh, is talking about it So uh, and it's no longer on their website. Uh, so we think we're sitting on a pretty good piece of gold at the moment. Uh, and it has three main rail transits uh, through uh, Central Asia, uh, two through Kazakhstan, one through uh, uh, Astana up to Moscow, uh, one through Kazakhstan to uh, Aktau, and one through Kyrgyzstan, down through Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, through Iran, uh, terminating in uh, in Turkey. So, uh, and and this map, the, the, the rail line that goes to Aktau, has uh, has the has the line and the plan for using the Caspian Sea ferry, uh, and has the line through the Caucasus for uh, for that route, and then aligning back to Istanbul and Piraeus on this side. So, uh, one having the plan <laughs> helps you know what's going on uh, at the central level in uh, China. Two, uh, all the problems that have been uh, uh, you know latest criticisms against China's Belt and Road program are that rail transport will never be able to compete with maritime transport, uh, and that there are very few goods uh, for which that timely arrival of being quicker than um, sea, but but uh, but but uh, but cheaper than air, uh, is going to work for. Now, this route through uh, the Black Sea, which is international waters. Uh, means that China only has to get to Anaklia in uh, Georgia, the deep water port uh, on one side, uh, only transits the Caucasus, which is uh, now joined by rail, thanks to Chinese uh, investment. Uh, and then the, then across the Caspian Sea is the uh, ocean again. And so you're only really crossing um, Kazakhstan and the Caucasus uh, by the slow rail route, uh, which is, I don't know, something like four or five times shorter than uh, than a Beijing to Moscow route. The Beijing to Moscow route has been there for uh, forever, <laughs> uh, but it's underutilized because it's too expensive. Um, so, I mean, the other thing to look at there is where China's putting its efforts and where the where not only the policy narratives have been going, but where uh, where China has been on the ground making agreements. Uh, Georgia is the first country in the Belt and Road countries to have a, a comprehensive free trade agreement with China. So that effectively for China turns Georgia into a, um, a, a trade throughput zone. There's uh, you know, basically 95% tariff-free trade two-way through Georgia. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not about China suddenly discovering a taste for Georgian wine. Uh, it's about being able to uh, uh, trade with Europe through Georgia. Uh, and obviously, uh, Kazakhstan has been at the, the forefront of the Belt and Road project since the start uh, and has probably the most developed plans in Beijing, at least, maybe not so much on the ground in Kazakhstan, but, um, but Kazakhstan is certainly China's linchpin for it. So it's really just taking the, the, the plans that are coming out of central China, uh, the central Chinese bureaucracy, uh, and to having a look and see what would work on the ground. Um, that if uh, you only have to really deal with Azerbaijan to put those uh, three pieces of the puzzle together and you have an effective trade zone from Korgos, which is owned by Costco, the Chinese shipping company, and Piraeus, which is owned by the Chinese shipping company in Athens, uh, and then that's, that's your trade route. That's the shortest uh, land route to, to China from Europe um, because it has very little land over it. That you can uh, half of it at least is uh, still uh, maritime transport, and that you know saves the cost. So that's the argument there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting stuff. And I had a question regarding your thoughts on the alliance between uh, the mutual alliance between Russia and China. I've been in Mongolia now, Kazakhstan, and, and Russia, and just from the on the ground level, with with uh, being with the people and talking with the people, I sensed a lot of um, suspicion of the, the Mongols and the Kazakhs, as well as some Russians, towards China um, in general. And both of the countries seem committed to a partnership in order to protect themselves. I guess one aspect is from America's long-term goal of trying to conquer the heartland, but as well as for economic prosperity. Um, but some aspects of China's Belt and Road seem to one-up or undermine Russia in, in some regards. 
how would you describe this relationship between the two? Um, can also considering the context of their other overlapping partnerships, which include the SCO, BRICS, and, and so on. Yeah, I, I think very much that uh, the, the Belt and Road strategy is designed to circumvent Russia and Russian influence. Um, there are a lot of maps uh, around the internet of the Belt and Road project, which shows a, a loop from Istanbul back up to Moscow and then over to Europe to Duisburg, which makes no sense at all. Um, most of the uh, investment, most of the agreements, most of the infrastructure um, is along those uh, two routes that go through Kazakhstan and um, uh, Caspian and down towards Iran and across to, to Turkey. Um, so I think very much historically there's a huge amount of mutual distrust between uh, China and Russia. Uh, I think in a lot of the literature of the 20th century, um, uh, Western analysts got this wrong and assumed that there was, uh, uh, you know, closer collusion than there was. Um, Mongolia is always trapped in the middle, is looking for its third neighbour out. Uh, again, I think, I think Mongolia gets pushed to the side on this one again. Um, they have a step road uh, industrial policy that's uh, designed to link up with the China's Belt and Road Initiative. But again, that rail line from, from Tianjin to UB to, to Moscow has been there forever. And it's not used. It's not used for uh, two reasons. It's, it's not economic. Uh, and there's no will on the on the part of Beijing uh, to extend that industrial infrastructure uh, into Mongolia. So the Mongolian question itself, I think they're they're on 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 the right track, uh, looking for the third neighbour uh, in that policy. I don't think they'll get very much out of the Belt and Road, and uh, and for Russia, almost the same deal. That you look at the amounts that are being invested or being um, earmarked for Russia. You're talking uh, hundreds of millions in agricultural um, land investment, whereas everywhere else we're talking about billions and tens of billions. So Russia, I think, is very much sidelined in this. And I, I think China would be extraordinarily pleased if they can somehow balance, uh, as you say, the heartland uh, against both uh, Russian and uh, American influence here. Um, you know, and remember, China throughout the Cold War was... Uh, effectively a, a, you know, a sole survivor. Um, their foreign policy was to have no foreign policy. Uh, and so it, it's not a diplomatic nation. It's not a nation like Russia or the United States that has a, a well-defined um, uh, and, and long historical uh, tradition of, uh, of diplomacy in these uh, great, great power global politics games. So um, that's again why I think the, those central routes through Kazakhstan and Iran are, are key because uh, the, the goals are Europe and Central Africa, and then the ways to ensure um, that you have the the amount of space and the amount of security um, that both Russia and uh, and the United States have enjoyed in different periods of history over the 20th century um, is what China is hoping to achieve uh, in order to be able to extend its um, you know its economic growth for um, for decades to come. And just briefly, your thoughts on Kazakhstan and how they will fare. You recently wrote about how China will be taking some of their overcapacity, uh, and they're gonna, they just made a deal with Kazakhstan where they're going to establish industrial parks where they'll, they, they will be producing machinery, glass, solar energy. You say there's no need for Astana to worry that overall, overall it looks positive for Kazakhstan? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Um, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite pessimistic because I think all of this industrial capacity uh, cooperation and Belt and Road movement of uh, uh, of old um, industrial capacity into external geographies, I think it is essentially bad for the host economy. Um, uh, you know, you can't have too much cement or steel or glass. Uh, they're all wonderful things to have. Um, but uh, China, certainly in Central Asia, is looking to move its old industrial complexes offshore. Um, and it's critically uh, for, for Kazakh capital, it's not opening the doors at home um, to allow Kazakh capital to come in. So Eurasian Resources Group 
um, recently complained that they weren't uh, allowed to list in the, the Shanghai Stock Exchange. They find their capital is uh, discriminated against in Chinese markets. And in China, uh, of course you say that, that uh, you know, we will go as far as we need to go to integrate with the global economy. You know, but but we, we don't want an American-style financial crisis happening here. Uh, and yet the, the Belt and Road uh, strategy, the international uh, cooperation strategy, is entirely predicated on moving Chinese capital uh, into external geographies. And so if uh, Kazakh capital uh, cannot go back the other way, then uh, it's, it's a one-way trade policy. And one-way trade <laughs> only benefits one state. So th there's those two things that really speak against the policy. Uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, and then as well, the 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 public administration or the the the, the firm level uh, um, transmission uh, of policy um, is, is is fairly weak as well. Um, so you get a lot of uh, top level agreements. You get a lot of um, policies coming out of the central bureaucracy in Beijing, um, but then how does that uh, transmit on the ground? Uh, to Kazakhstan is uh, is yet to be seen over the coming uh, couple of years as most of the policy in China is enacted at the provincial and prefectural levels. So it's the provinces and the, and the cities that need to be moving these factories offshore, that need to be organising the capital to go out uh, and organising the productive capacity to bring uh, uh, commodities back in. And so I see a sort of circuit breaker there because I'm not sure um, that China really has the public administration or policy depth uh, to be able to coordinate this multi-level governance across uh, across multiple geographies. So, yeah, in Beijing and Astana, I think it looks uh, like an excellent cooperation. Um, but uh, what it looks like to people on the ground uh, and whether or not there's going to be enough um, uh, two-way trade and investment, I'm quite sceptical. Just real quick uh, question on the overcapacity. I've got some friends out in the Americas and they've started purchasing products through apps uh, online from China. They get them pretty quick. They're, they're surprised by the quality and they're often very cheap. And sometimes they get a lot of free stuff. Would the overcapacity explain why a lot of these products are super cheap or even free sometimes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, China's been dumping aluminium and steel on Asian markets uh, for the past four years. Um, I don't follow other sectors, uh, glass and paper. Um, I, I don't know, but I have very strong suspicions that they've been dumping cement as well, um, particularly in Africa. And so this is, this is a very good uh, geopolitical question um, because you're right at the, the end of the transition period for China to become a market economy under the WTO arrangements. Um, and, uh, and yet they continue, on one hand, yeah, they, uh, they, they make too many factories, they're outputting too much uh, uh, cement, aluminium, steel, uh, and yeah, and it's being dumped. It's not bad. It's not poor quality um, steel or aluminium. It's just that none of the other players can compete with it um, because it's subsidised by the Chinese taxpayer and it's being sold below cost. Um, you know, that's, that's not acceptable in the WTO framework, uh, but... <laughs> By the same token, China's closing a lot of these factories as it tries to clean up its, uh, its environmental um, pollution problems. Um, it's trying to move into to higher value-added uh, goods. It's trying to move into um, high technology uh, sectors where it'll have um, uh, new competitive advantages as, it, as, as everybody is on the horizon um, so it doesn't have a catch-up uh, industrialization problem. So, you know, like everything in China, there's no... There's no one China and there's no China policy. Um, there's, there's, there's market liberals and there's conservatives like everywhere else. So uh, it's, really, it's really the interplay between those um, policy narratives to see you know, what will happen over the next uh, five or ten year period, whether China continues to, to flout um, the, the WTO uh, and, and dumps these uh, industrial products on international markets, or whether that's, that's cyclical, it's part of this uh, you know, two to three year uh, cleaning up of its, uh, its overcapacity problem. And then once it does clean up the overcapacity problem, then I, I suspect that it will be competing uh, on a very level playing field in, um, in robotics, in artificial intelligence, uh, in other uh, high-end uh, manufacturers. And it will be in China's interest to be using the WTO um, to, bring, uh, to bring other states uh, to bear. 
And is there anything else that I've I've missed or or, or you feel that is important that, that uh, should be mentioned regarding uh, the new Silk Road in China? Uh, I think one thing that seems to escape a lot of analysts is 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 the long term trajectory. Um, it's being sold by China as an infrastructure project. Um, and as an infrastructure project, it means you're just competing with other development banks and policy banks, um, which means, uh, you know, there's, there's not too much you can say against China in, in that sphere. Um, but if you start to see this as, uh, as an import strategy, uh, as part of a wider trade strategy for China eventually being a net importer of, uh, of consumer goods, um, then I think things start to make a little bit more sense. China's been an importer of capital for the last 30 years. The last couple of years, I'm not sure when, it's just switched over to being a net exporter of capital. Um, but it's, being, it's a net exporter of capital behind a closed capital account, as I said. So it's, it's moving to, uh, to be a net exporter of capital, uh, but it's not following a, a flying geese paradigm. It's not having a, a convertible currency, which means that, uh, that these kind of firms will be competing with everybody else. So I think that... That poses uh, severe structural problems for the global economy when you extrapolate that out uh, 10, 15, 20 years when China becomes a net importer of consumer goods like the United States, given that at the moment it's effectively setting up a parallel trading investment architecture. So uh, look, think about it in terms of decades rather than um, uh, than years and uh, the problems start to emerge, I think. All right. And... Are there opportunities for everyday people to participate in and profit from the Belt and Road somehow? Small businesses, whether they are in foreign countries and they want to import, export, or, or people living near the New Silk Road, what are your thoughts there? What, what have you seen? Yeah, look, again, it's easy to be pessimistic, but um, I think there are a lot of opportunities, um, particularly, particularly because the industries that China's moving, they're not. They're not small-scale, uh, simple labor inputs. Um, they're industrial complexes. And if you're talking about moving an industrial complex somewhere, then particularly in Central Asia, it fixes a lot of the structural problems um, uh, that were left when the when the Soviets withdrew. That the entire Central Asian region uh, if, uh, operates as one industrial complex. But once you break it up into to individual states, all of those complexes are broken. Uh, and so there's a series of holes in, in, in all the industrial economies there. So uh, in the sense of a rising tide lifting all ships, uh, I think China's investment in industrial uh, infrastructure in Central Asia uh, should raise the per capita GDP of everybody. Um, in terms of other structural changes that these states need to make to accommodate China, uh, I think that benefits individuals as well. Um, Uzbekistan uh, recently depegged the SOM uh, and started to liberalise its um, foreign exchange regime, allowing foreigners to open bank accounts, allowing um, uh, residents to um, uh, to freely exchange currency. I mean that that's all um, uh, that all encourages uh, foreign direct investment from any state, not just China. Um, so moving a lot of these countries into the global trade regime uh, is absolutely going to run b benefit people on the ground, um, and and China is going to have to Chinese capital is going to have to compete um, with every other form of capital uh, if these economies open up to, to foreign direct investment. But in terms of actual Belt and Road projects, they're mega projects for mega corporations and. Uh, you know, they're, they're tied up with government uh, more than they are with market. So uh, I wouldn't be expecting any cement to fall off the truck. Okay. And do uh, you have any final thoughts as well as if you could tell us more perhaps about your work, about future risk and how people can best follow uh, your writings and analysis? Sure. Well, at, at Future Risk, we're helping uh, governments and corporations to follow China's geoeconomic policy in uh, Central Asia, ASEAN, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, and we're doing that with uh, a primary source Chinese database. Um, so we're mapping and tracking um, uh, Chinese government institutions uh, and, uh, and basically abstracting out every policy document that comes out uh, regarding uh, industrial infrastructure, uh, trade, 
and uh, the, the geoeconomic policy. So uh, essentially we're sitting on a database which uh, tells us where China's moving uh, before it actually moves. Um, so we're helping uh, large corporations and uh, governments, as I say, to help understand uh, China's movements, particularly in, um, in Central Asia and the Middle East. And again, that's, that's where this uh, thing gets very interesting because uh, Central Asia, Middle East and East Africa are all areas that, in the heartland analysis, are up for grabs. Um, that the, the, the globalization agenda uh, left behind or distorted uh, and so China coming through that axis of uh, Central Asia, the Middle East and Eastern Central Africa, um, it, it fundamentally rebalances the world. And so um, uh, there are a variety of interests uh, uh, which need to pay attention to this um, more than simply following the headlines uh, and reacting to what China does on the Belt and Road. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Tristan, for this uh, interview. Central Asia is a majestic place with a long and fascinating history. People should uh, learn more about this step, venture out of here. I would hope that the Belt and Road proves to be a win-win for all, but as you say, uh, you're in the business of political and economic risk, so we'll just have to be careful. Yes, indeed. <laughs>